My psychologist, Dr. Jonathan Frid, is with me in some way. And since this is a psychologist episode, if you want to get chugged out off of booze, you should drink every time someone on this episode says the word mind. By the way, doctor, you're... Dr. Frid, you're the 19th doctor I've had on this show so far. Oh, thank you. That's excellent to hear, Peter, my patient. And thank you so much. I didn't get a chance to look at the questions that you had for me, but I have a few questions for you myself. I heard your last podcast where you interviewed your old college friend. And I just have to tell you, I have to ask, what's your favorite writer? I don't know. Right now, maybe Wallace. A few months ago, maybe Plath, Doctor. It depends on what I'm reading and getting impressed by. Now, Peter, suppose you came across a podcast of your favorite writer in the whole wide world. And as you listened, it slowly dawned on you that the podcast was just 20 minutes of your favorite writer being snarky and painfully naive about how writing careers work. Wouldn't you have been sorely disappointed in them? Wouldn't you have been embarrassed to hear them assert sarcastic propositions that would be incorrect if they were translated into corresponding sincere propositions? Wouldn't you be saddened to realize that such barren soil is all that is strewn through your favorite writer's mind? Well, I sure would, Doc. Peter, that's what you sounded like when you had that novelist on last week. You couldn't have sounded more naive. You couldn't have sounded more mentally barren. I knew I could count on you to improve my mental well-being, Dr. Frid. I'll say this, that I don't think a person can be someone's favorite writer if they waste around trying to do 50 podcasts rather than work on their stories, etc. I don't think it's looking all too hopeful in that particular depth, so I don't think anyone will ever suffer that particular disappointment you just described. But Peter, don't you want to be someone's favorite writer? Doctor, I was being mean before, but here, truly, your insight fails to fail me, for indeed, that is my dandiest goal, and I'm not talking about being my mom's favorite writer either. You don't have to write a word to be your mom's favorite writer. I'm talking strangers right now. So then, Peter, if your podcast makes it impossible for you to be someone's favorite writer, then you know what you must do. You're saying quit the whole game at 12 or so episodes and devote the time otherwise slated to get squandered on the next 38 instead writing fiction so compelling that eventually someone mentions my name in passing on a podcast of the future. That's my suggestion, Peter. Now, Doctor, tell me about your f- bat sh**iest current patient, please, Dr. Frid. And the voices kind of embarrass me, too. I c- kind of can deal with them sometimes. Your voices... Your voices... And you, you kind of set yourself up a little bit with your question there. Your curse-laden question for an insult. Unless you're one of those perverse people who who, like, tell everybody, like, I'm so crazy, and so in that case you were fishing for a compliment. Either way, I have a different person in mind. You are not. You are fine. But now that you're not going to be a podcast man, we need to discuss what your future plans are. Well, I always kind of wanted to be a monk in one of the false religions. And why why would you want to be in the, in the false one? Well, I always kind of like mortification, and I think the some of the real false ones have a lot of mortifications, and you know which ones I'm talking about, Professor. I mean, Doctor. You're getting a little edgy, I think, Peter. But tell, what is, what is it? What? Tell me a little bit about what you like about mortifications. Well, I just like depriving myself of things. I see Kramer. Well, I'm not trying to make a riff or anything, but if I have, you know, don't let myself do stuff, I take things that are fun away from myself. I feel like 
good man instead of bad man. And we say, you know, in this this world of ours, everybody's so obsessed with avoiding boredom and avoiding quiet time when sometimes that's all we need. You know, it's always go, 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 buy this, buy that. Sometimes we just have to stop and not do things we want on purpose because so many of the things we want to do we can as first world adults but also a lot of them are bad for us and so I think for me 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 because I'm not gonna I can't make anybody else uh, undergo the various mortifications that I like to undergo what kinds of mortifications do you like to undergo? Actually, I guess a lot of the stuff I don't do is because of other reasons other than just enjoying not giving myself things. Peter, you're... But so you were telling me before I turned the cameras on that... Who was it? it was, there was like three, it was like three different situations with this one person. And I know there's like a patient doctor privilege thing, but something tells me nobody's gonna get in trouble if you just tell me what's going on with that one patient. Ah, uh, yes, patient, I like to call her patient 17. And, okay, fine, you squeezed it out of me, Peter. I'm going to tell you a little story. It has several sections to it, so pay close attention for you see patient 17, as she will be called, unless... Actually, no, how about patient? Patient presented with s strange knowledges, and her mind seemed bigger each day I saw her, for I saw her every day, and she told me her name is Samantha. But I did not believe her, because, like her mom told me that it, there wasn't her name. And it turns out, so, like, she was reading these, like, really, really unusual magazines. And she found this um, uh, mentalist, which is, like, called what psychics call themselves. And she got involved with this mentalist. It just became... She went deeper and deeper into the mentalist, to various mentalist cadres, and but so like she, eventually it, it fell out that she, a mentalist, possessed her brain, and it's not really clear to me why a mentalist would be interested in invading the brain of a victim or a psychic. I don't know why a psychic would do that, because it seems like you're not getting any you already have access to this person's mind right so what would you be gaining from possessing their mind and it seems like so the mentalist and this wasn't even a, like the mentalist who entered her mind wasn't even a normal mentalist she became interested in this kind of Pleiadian idea of the those those beings who live on the Pleiades worlds and there are quite a few of the wor of quite a few worlds in the, the Pleiades or as it is known in Japan Subaru either way there are a lot of worlds around there and they do send signals to certain mentalists in who are currently working on earth and, and the signals enter their most enter their brains and set up shop in those brains and keep the mentalists plugging along because these beings who do live on the Pleiades worlds are kind of like I mean they have plans for the race of our people and this is the mentalist who entered the mind of Samantha Samantha Badra is her name and so now Samantha is the one who is telling me that all of these alien creatures are playing a little game of telephone in the front of her mind the plan is the, Ple the Pleiadian beings who are from another world have sent several 
hundred theories into the the basically into the face of this mentalist who has died and the ghost of the mentalist whose name I have not been able to squeeze out of my patient quite yet possessed the body of or possessed the brain of Samantha and is now relaying she's a relay switch between the Pleiadian beings and Samantha now it takes a lot of effort to put all this together for me but I think I'm starting to figure out what the plan is what my what my scope of work is on her brain once I tease out the Pleiadian message it'll be much more easy to help her and to help the mentalist who has possessed my patient the way a demon possesses people and possess I mean and the aliens who have possessed the mentalist it's a little bit of a nesting doll of in of body invasion but it's kind of a lame nesting doll because there's only three dolls in the shape of living beings with inner lives and everything so it's actually kind of cool I don't know so tell me doctor tell me a little bit about your or about one of these 100 theories that you were talking about yeah so there are a hundred theories Peter my patient and I'm only going to tell you one of them. Well, we don't have all day. No, we don't. So I'm going to mention my favorite one, which is one that was passed down to me by... Er, oh, I'm sorry. So it was passed down to Samantha by a gene ray, something she called a gene ray, which is a ray that the Pleiadians send to earth in the, sh the fastest way possible a straight line and that goes into mentalists psychics and several other kinds of people telepaths telekinetes synesthetes um and there's one more well i'll think of it and so this gene ray geometers and so this gene ray enters all of their brains and tells them one out of the 100 theories. Now why is it 100? I was always under the impression that we p humans put emphasis on the number 100 because it was 10 groups of 10 and we put emphasis on the number 10 because that's the number of fingers we have fingers and thumbs if that's the kind of person you are well that was explained to me by Samantha I of course I had that question too why would an alien be interested in 100 theories and she said it was because they were only willing to tell us a hundred because a hundred we like loved the number a hundred so bad that we decided to that they decided to give us one hundred. so I'm sure they have plenty more theories out there that like corresponds to some body part of theirs but they wanted us to be comfortable with the theories. Anyway, I'll give you one of the theories. It was it was something. This is the one I understand most, and it goes a little something like. And by the way, they just have this whole website about it. Like the Pleiadians set up this website. Um, uh, I forget what it's called. Well, let me just. Um, just uh, looking uh, looking it up on my iPhone. So here we go, and it's basically more or less about the shape of the Earth. Like usually, so we have uh, it's navel connects four corner four S. Uh, God is born of a mother. She left belly B signature. Belly B proves four corners. Lie that corrupts Earth, you educated fools. Belly button logic works. Adults eat teenagers alive. No record of their death. Belly button is the signature of your personal creator. Rationale brain to a half brain slave. It goes on to suggest you ignore three of four days. Force four days on Earth. They already exist. In only one Earth rotation, four angles stood on four corners. Four corners rotate to 16 corners, which equal to four corner days. 
Uh, Earth has four corners simultaneous four day time cube within single rotation. Four corner days prove one day one. Uh, ignorance of time cube for simple math. Uh, I am a knower of four corner simultaneous 24 days that occur within a single four corner rotation of Earth. So there's, you know, and that's just kind of one, kind of just a summary of one of their theories. They have a few going on, and it's, uh, and, but that's the one I think once I get that one, I'll be able to diagnose Samantha with a certain illness and finally get her the help she needs. Because, of course, I see her every day because I work at the state H and she lives at the state H and uh, that's basically the plan by the way Peter do you maybe think you're um, making light of mental illness a little bit when you asked me that question because that's not actually a very nice thing to call someone the th thing that you called someone that you bleeped out live well I'll tell you something doc there's a few things that you should put on the internet and a few things that you shouldn't and it doesn't need they're all the same if nobody listens to your show if anybody I realized that the only way to do the right thing is well you know probably I do I do wrong thing most of the time but I also feel like if nobody listens to it, no one will be hurt. Uh, I I feel like I could probably... I'm just kidding around. Well, no, I'm not making fun of crazy people. I'm making fun of, you know, the way people, crazy people are depicted in our society. You know, I'm making fun of the stereotype itself rather than the... By my very question, Doctor, that I asked you, I make I made fun of the stereotype of of people with mental health health issues, rather than those people themselves. Mm, okay, Peter, I think I well, I I would say that if this if this YouTube thing that you're doing, I would say if it got more hits, you'd be in a big mess of trouble, and you'd have to do some kind of apology like Twitter apology where you're like I can't believe what I said if I hurt anybody I didn't mean to so I hope this may I hope my thing apology makes you all happy idiots which I don't actually say because but that's what I think one of those like really bad apologies well you know I could do that doc but I don't think anyone is ever going to care. Nobody cares about stuff unless it's cool. That's the thing. If, like, by even suggesting that my question about the crazy person would cause some kind of a controversy, that's suggesting that. Have you listened to this pot? Very many episodes of this doctor. Well, I'm told I'm going to. I was going to this weekend, actually. My that was my plan. Well, see, that's what I mean. It's not gonna matter. No one's gonna give any. No one is gonna care, Doctor. There's not gonna be any controversy by even suggesting that there's gonna be controversy about the crazy person thing. You are flattering me, and so there's no. So it, it's not even a point. There's no even point in asking me about that. It wasn't mean, it was fine. Thank you, doctor. You are my doctor, and you're, you're the best. And I think I'm supposed to, I'll drive you home, but I have to do, I have to just wait in the other room. Hold on. I got a text message on my phone from my friend, Stefan Anaker, who he just recently translated a, br a few brief, a very brief text by Vasu Bandu called A Method for Argumentation, aka in Sanskrit, Vada Vidi. So and he, wanted, he just wanted me to read texts one through four. Or he sent me texts, four texts, text messages. The topic, Paksa, is the object of sense or understanding one wishes to investigate. End note. 
Throughout this translation, object means an object of sense or understanding. Return to text. The characteristic of a thesis is the statement of a demonstrandum, i.e. something which one attempts to demonstrate. It cannot exist without the statement of a demonstrandum, i.e. one or another among the various events which could be demonstrated. That is, an event with inferability is accepted only because there is a statement of an example with inferability, such as fire, a seed, or the non-eternality of sound of speech. In various stock examples of events with inferability, a fire is inferable where there is smoke, a previously existing seed is inferable where there is a fruit, and the non-eternality of sound of speech is inferable from their state of arising immediately upon an effect. There is no assertion which demonstrates in an argument if another event which can be demonstrated, among the many which could be demonstrated, is argued for, because a specified event associate has not been asserted as having demonstrability through an event which can be demonstrated, i.e., the event associate fire is related to the event smoke which can be demonstrated, since smoke is always concomitant with fire, but water is not as water is not an event associate of the event smoke. A justification is an indication of the invariable concomitance of an event with something of such and such a kind, i.e., an event's not arising if something of such and such a kind does not exist. Something of such and such a kind in a demonstrandum is, for example, non-eternality, etc., in reference to an object like sounds of speech. There must thus be an indication of some event which does not exist unless concomitant with another, i.e., if there is a cessation of one, the other cannot exist. A justification exists only when there is an indication of an invariable concomitance of an event associate with something of such and such a kind. For example, the invariable concomitance of a state of arising due to an effort with non-eternality, or of smoke with fire. If it is a statement of such a kind, because of a state of arising immediately upon an effort, it is a justification, i.e., in the argument, sounds of speech are non-eternal because of their state of arising immediately upon an effort. Because of their state of arising immediately upon an effort is a justification, because of the invariable concomitance of a state of arising immediately upon an effort with non-eternality. There is no justification where there is no such indication of an invariable concomitance, for instance, when one says, sound is non-eternal because of its perceptibility by the eye. So, did you need a ride, dude?